everybody All yes right. okay uh so this is my father 1935 he was 12 i just made the point that my, he did not grow up in a shtetl he grew up in a modern like suburb like where we live here and they had modern schools modern everything uh for their times of course all right next picture All right, everything was sort of hunky-dory in Europe until 1939. And uh, uh, there was a big war, it was World War II. And basically Germany declared war on, I think the whole world. And my parents, my ancestors were stuck in the middle of all this. I don't know if you could see my little arrow, but they lived down here in, in Central Europe. Uh, things started changing. Uh, the Nazis believed the Jews were subhuman and were tainting the bloodline of humans. And therefore, uh, they came up with a society based on what they believe was racial purity. And uh, we as Jews were considered, my family as Jews were considered subhuman and had to be um, uh, uh, driven away from Germany and German lands. And uh, they were sent to other places. They had relocation. It was like a movement where they wanted to relocate non-Aryans into Russia. They forced them to go to Russia because they didn't belong in uh, Central Europe. And what they did in the meantime is they gathered all the Jews and they started labeling them because most of us Jews don't look like, I mean, we do look like Aryans. So to distinguish us from others, uh, they started demanding that people of the areas they conquered uh, be uh, labeled. So they started putting these Jewish stars on them. Uh, Hold on, I'm going to close my door. Sorry about that. Uh, and as you can see, this is a picture of my father and his friends. If you look on their sleeves, you can actually see um, that they're wearing a Jewish uh, star. You see that? Uh, that's a very rare picture. I don't even know how it, yes, I do know how it survived. The gentleman on the left survived the war and he was able to go back to his ancestor's town and he had a Christian friend who hid some of these pictures because at this age, my father is around 15 or 16 and they belonged to a photography, photography club and they used to develop their own pictures. Uh, if things weren't that bad after my parents' family relocated, so it was my father, his mother, uh, and his three siblings. They moved them to a little city a few miles from the town they were born. It was called Keti, which was maybe five or 10 miles from uh, auschwitz which is actually the, the Polish name for Auschwitz, the city of Auschwitz. Uh, at that time, my father was not arrested yet, but they had to wear these yellow Jewish stars. As you can see, they're actually wearing them. And this is uh, I believe March 1942. Uh, and uh, just after this, during this time, my father was still living with his uh, mother and siblings and things were getting ugly. And I thought this is something new that I do now. I'm going to share with you a Shoah Foundation clip of interviewing my father and my father was a very he was a loving man i never ever saw him cry maybe once or twice in my entire life but when they interviewed him he told this story and i, I wanted to share with you so hold on for a second everybody i'm gonna share it <laughs> it is one of these uh, let's see. Hold on. Uh, unfortunately, my window closed. Uh, give me one second. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if most, most of you probably know that the Shoah Foundation 
got a big donation from uh, the Spielberg Foundation, and they try to record any possible uh, survivor. So here is, I'm going to share this. There it is. I found it. Okay. Can you guys see it? Can you guys see it? Hello? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So here's a clip of my father. It's a two hour interview, but he tells an interesting story. And if you didn't understand his English, I'll explain it afterwards. Oh, you know what? I, I did do one mistake. I got to share again. I didn't share my audio, so I got to do this again. I'm sure after I do this 20 times, I'll get really good at this. Okay, everybody? <laughs> okay, here we go. I got the two today. Here at my nose. When the switching control. I got the other. Interesting, this come out now. When I see the old, this come out. Before this, almost I not feel this. Now I feel, now I see this and I feel it. I was over there in the Jewish community office in the What Nogi. was the name of that community? Auschwitz, Auschwitz, community, Auschwitz Jewish community. Yeah. I was over there in the no giving up of community. I was just sitting over there in the community. I remember a day. I was staying in a door in a building over there. I was walking a, a woman with a child. The mother says, I'm come to her and take the child for his hands. Take it with the legs and put it on the head. That was a word. It's like a, a, a yam in two of that word. I was staying over there and looking. I said, This same man was going with a bell. And on this bell, this is not this man. I said, For this man, the German army got a bell. And on the bell was, was a right, the God with uns. Thus, God is with us. Speak good German tone. I know the, the German one. Hello, Harry of the bells. As I remind, I said, this same, I believe in the same God. Was he believe? Mark Bornstein, please mute. I don't pretend to believe. I said, I know, I know. When I see what I see, I know, I know can believe. And I can tell you all my life, I not believe. To the point. All right, guys, I'm going to go back to the other share. All right. Can you can you guys hear me? Yeah. All right, uh, I'm gonna. Okay, uh, I'm gonna sh go back to the presentation. C can you folks still hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, he, my father was telling this story, uh, and it was around the time of when this picture was taken. And what he was—I don't know if you folks heard it—but he was telling a story that. He was walking and he saw a, a bunch of uh, uh, Jewish soldiers, excuse me, German Nazi soldiers uh, harassing a woman with a baby. The officer took the baby from her arms in his legs and then swung it against the wall next to him. And the baby's head just smashed and he just threw away the, the baby. And my father just lost lost faith after that because all the German soldiers that, that were around him were wearing a belt buckle that says God is with us. And my father said that there, ca there cannot be a God that allows this horror to happen. And my father was also saying that he could not help this woman. He couldn't do a damn thing because if he did, they would have killed him on the spot. So I wanted to share that with you. I thought that was a profound story, but that was my father. That was recorded in 1995. All right, let's continue. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. All right, so that story my father just did, he was at that age. That's what he was witnessing. And also he was beaten at the time. Well, 
if things could not get any worse, they got a lot worse. Um, my father uh, in his town, the Jews that were living there, got an order one afternoon that they have like one day to meet in the high school gymnasium. And everybody had to come there, all the families, all the Jews, and bring stuff with them because they were being relocated. Uh, my father went with his mother and his siblings. My father was the oldest of uh, three. He had two brothers and a sister. They all went to this hall, and right away they separated them. On the left side of the hall were uh, men over the age of 16 and under the age of uh, 70. And on the right side were women, children, uh, and uh, uh, with kids under the age of 16. Yes, someone has a question? Okay, I'm gonna keep going. So uh, my father saw his mother, he looked at her and he saw his siblings being taken with her and he never saw them again. That was, uh, that was it. Uh, my father never saw, okay, someone has, okay. Sorry about that, we had echo. All right, so my father never saw his family ever again after that. So what happened? I don't have pictures, but I can tell you from history books based on my father's story of what happened to him. Um, little story, be, they, they, they relocated them to ghettos. Ghettos were like areas, concentrated areas that would be like closed off from the rest of the community. My father was not sent to, to Krakow Getter, but my mother, my mother and her family were evacuated or ordered to go into the Krakow Ghetto. Uh, I was able to find pictures of the ID cards uh, that was issued at the Krakow ghetto, ghetto. And I'm sharing those with you because I was shocked. I, it came to my attention last August. I, a common cousin of mine from Israel turned me on to this database. And I found a record of my mother's mother that I never even seen a picture of her ever. Never, never seen a picture of her. And that's the lady on the right. And do you see that date that says the 20th, it's the 20th day of August, 1940. This picture was revealed to me, ladies and gentlemen, on August 20th of 2020. I, th this came, th this, this is, this almost puts hair on my chest. The same day, 80 years ago, my, 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 my grandmother on my mother's side was filled out this form of her entering the Krakow uh, ghetto. The lady on the left is actually the ID card of my mother. Uh, my mother was the youngest of four sisters. And here's, uh, here's, here's what they were issued at the, at, the, at the ghetto. As you can see, they still look pretty healthy here. This is just the beginning of the ghetto. The, uh, the concentration of Jews in Krakow, and that became a ghetto. So my, I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, my, I told you the story of my father, what happened afterwards. So I had to go to history books to try to illustrate to you what happened. My father said that they were loaded and he was loaded. He does not know what happened to his siblings, but I'll tell you that story in a minute. He would, they were put on wagons. They were put on these truck wagons and forced to evacuate straight from that gymnasium on that night. Here's an example of what it probably looked like. Uh, after they were taken on trucks, they were, my father said they were put on transport trains and these are not trains meant to carry passengers. These are uh, either cargo trains or livestock trains, okay? And they were just put on these trains and they were told they were going to, to be relocated. Uh, these ghettos got really bad. I mean, food was in short supply, um, a lot of uh, corruption. 
uh, things got really, really bad to the point that we, people were literally starving in the street. Uh, they try to make a regular life in these ghettos and they would have schools. Um, my mother said they, they try to live a normal life, but things were just getting really bad. Starvation and sickness was kicking in. Here's a picture of kids in a school waiting for, to get their food. Um, if that wasn't bad enough, one day an order came to, my, mo my mother lived in the Krakow ghetto, so I'm going to talk a little bit about her. They were evacuated, as you saw on these trains, and they took them. My mother was saved because she, was, she, was, she, she and her sisters were very pretty, and they were able and strong, and they were deemed usable for labor. So they took them into these barracks in Auschwitz, and they were labor camps. They were not intended to be death camps yet. They were there, met, they were factories. They would sew uh, uniforms. They would uh, build armament. Uh, they use slave labor. The Nazis used slave labor to power their war machine. And they use people like my parents as slave laborers. And as you can see, this is what my mother described of how they lived. Pretty bad. If this wasn't bad enough, after they were not used for labor anymore in late 19, in mid 1940s, an order came from Germany. It was an unofficial uh, proclamation and that was the final solution. The final solution was to dispose of all the non-essential people or non-Aryans. And they basically created a factory and a system to concentrate people kill them and mass burn them or mass bury them. At first they buried them, but that was just too much to bury. So they started coming with more sanitary means of disposing the bodies. My father did describe piles of people like what you're seeing on the right. He actually witnessed that. I want you to notice that you see the people in stripes. Those were not Nazis, those were prisoners who were used, a lot of them were Jews or political prisoners, and they were used to dispose of the bodies and they were obviously well fed so that they could do the labor of disposing the bodies. So this was a very efficient uh, killing murder machine that was devised by the Nazis. And my father and mother went through this. Uh, Burying the bodies was too much. They deemed the best, most efficient way to dispose of bodies was to uh, incinerate them. And they built mass incineration ovens. And here's a picture of, of one of them. And that's how they ultimately disposed of the bodies. Um, my mother, I, my, my, my mother and father never spoke to me or very rarely about what happened to them. Very, very rarely. But once in a while, they would have friends or colleagues that they knew from the war and they would get together and I would listen in as a little boy. And I remember my mother talking to her friends about living in the barracks, like you saw the ladies there. And they knew when there's going to be a big transport of Jews from around Europe because they would turn on these ovens to, in preparation for mass uh, 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 burning of bodies. They would have to heat them up and they, the prisoners who would be downwind, they could see the smoke coming out of the crematoria and the smell. And they knew that there, there's going to be trains coming and they're gonna dispose the bodies. And it was just part of their daily life. My mother was, at the Auschwitz camps for about three to four years. And this was normal life for them. And lucky for them, they, they, were, they were used as labor, slave labor. Uh, when all the dust settled in Europe, the allies did conquer Europe. And this is the only record or pictures or anything that I have a written record that my grandmother and, and my uncle and my aunts on my father's side ever existed. This is a, a, a testimonial that my father filled out in 1953, I believe. 
uh, at Yad Vashem in Israel, they were they had this program where they wanted to document all the people. It was a new thing in the 50s. And my father was encouraged and all other Holocaust survivors to write a written, written record of every person that they knew that vanished in the war. Uh, so here's the only proof that I have that my mother, my grandmother and my uncles ever existed. And I'm, I'm happy to have this because if this was not written, I, I wouldn't have any written record except for stories that my father told me. So what happened to my father? My father did survive. What happened to him? Well, he was, taking in, he was taken into a, a labor camp, a slave labor camp, and he was put to work. Here's an example of what they probably look like. They were put in these uniforms. Uh, this is a sample of, of the barracks of how they lived while they were laborers. Uh, this picture is actually of uh, 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 Eli Wiesel. He's in this picture. Many of you have seen this. I believe he's one of these people looking at us. This was taken after the Americans got into the uh, uh, death camps and they asked these people to pose to show you their living quarters. Now, my father was a slave laborer for many years. And then finally, they put him in this wagon. Do you see these wagons? This is how my father described it. It was a cattle cars with no roof. They just packed them shoulder to shoulder people in these, in these trucks, not trucks, these uh, uh, carts, these railroad. And they were, they didn't know where they were going, but my father knew that this is it. And he knew this was it because there was nothing in these carts. There was no food, no water, no place to go to the bathroom. And they kept them locked in there for days. Okay. The only, the only way out was if they opened the doors and there were machine gun nests and everything. You couldn't do a damn thing. Uh, they kept them in these carts and people started freezing and dying around my father. And there was somebody he knew, a young man standing next to me, he says, Natek, my father's name, we have to get out of here. We're not going to come out of this train alive if we don't escape. So they were in this cart, people were dying, and this train stopped. In the middle of Germany, somewhere it stopped. In the middle of the night, it was dark, foggy night, and my father and his friend, my, the, my father was afraid. So the friend says, you know what? I'm going to go first. You follow me. His friend jumped out and started running in the snow. And he was running. And my father saw it. And he jumped out of the cart. And he started running. And they both of them ran for their lives. They ran until they saw a barn. They got into the barn. And there was a bunch of pigs in there, I guess. You, you put them there to you know, get them away from the cold air. And they saw pig food, you know, like beets. They used to feed him sugar beets, big sugar beets. And he and his friends just gorged on these, on, on, you know, whatever they found. In the morning, the housekeepers or the, the farm workers found them in the barn because they had, they had their uniforms on. And they looked at my parents. My father spoke perfect German and he was able to say, oh, we were just passing by, but they knew what was going on. They brought the house mistress, the lady master of the house. She came to the barn, she saw them and she goes, oh my God. And she says, y y do not move, do not leave this barn. If anybody, if my, my, her husband was a Nazi officer and she says, I will help you. She got in touch with her family in the nearest town and they were able to sneak my father and his friend to this town, to a very, very devout Lutheran family who hid my father for the rest of the war. For about a few months after the war, they hid my father. And that's how my father survived. If he didn't, if he didn't jump out of the trains, they would have come out like what you're seeing right now. They were just dead bodies. This picture was taken after the Americans invaded that part of Germany. The lady at the bottom was the lady who, my father, to him, she was an angel because she spoon fed him and his friend. The other gentleman on her right is her friend. 
and uh, she spoon fed those two guys back to life. They, my father said that he, he was about 5'10". He weighed 70, uh, 70 pounds, 30 kilograms. He weighed 35 kilograms. 70 pounds. He was just a walking skeleton. I, I don't know how they survived, but they survived. Thanks to this family that hid them. My mother, uh, my mother, my mother had three sisters, three siblings and aunts and uncles. And she was spared because she was able to work and she was an able bodied woman. And so were her sisters. This is a picture of my mother when she was entered into Krakow ghetto. Um, my mother-in-law, my mother-in-law grew up in Germany. There's a picture of her on the left, on the top. Uh, she was around 14 or 15 when Crystal Night happened. And this is her town in Cologne. And do you see the Nazi flags? This, this picture survived because the lady in the cart, the baby in the cart survived the war and her family um, brought this picture. So uh, my, mother, my mother-in-law is pushing the cart and uh, look at the Nazi flags. I'm sure that was very intimidating for them. Anyways, Kristallnacht happened uh, and also they killed her father. He was, a, he was a socialist, but not a national socialist in Germany. And the brown shirts during a demonstration uh, picked on them and killed. And they brought my mother's grandfather home dead, his body. They just dropped him. Uh, they were able to escape Germany before 1939. My mother-in-law ended up in Colombia. There's a picture of her in Colombia. And she survived in Colombia until the 50s. My father, my father, after the war, he, he went home. Where do you go after a thing like that? You go home, right? Well, my father went to his town in Germany. He went home in Poland and his Christian friend, school friend recognized him and the school friend approached him and he told him, Natik, how are you? How did you survive? This is nice to see you. Come to, come to dinner at my house. And then at the same time, he told him, don't tell anybody who you really are. I'm going to introduce you as my friend, but not of who you are, because if they would have found out who he was, they would have murdered him because his family owned properties and homes and any returning Jews from the war were basically murdered so that they don't claim their territory back. My father knew he had no home. He had to escape from that village, which was his home. And he had no home. The home that my father found was with other refugees and they were led to the promised land uh, with a mass exodus from Europe. Uh, they made it to, back then it was called Palestine in 1945, but it, uh, in the, it would become Israel. And here's a picture of my father. He was, he was, he was adopted in Israel by a kibbutz that was established by people from his part of Poland. And here he is on the horse, that's my father. He was, he, he really loved living in a kibbutz. And my mother lived in the kibbutz too. And that's how they met. They met at this kibbutz. So I wanted to share some of these pictures with you. Uh, my father was soon enlisted in the uh, War of Independence, Milchemet HaShichru in Israel. My father was a machine gunnist. He was, th these four people were uh, like a troop working together in the field in infantry. And their job was to man and carry all the equipment and bullets to 
to support this machine gun. Some of you war people might recognize what machine guns, but it's a heavy caliber machine gun. And this, this was a team. And my father helped build the state of Israel. They were fighting in the north. And here's a picture of his platoon or his little group of men during War of Independence in Israel, 1948. Uh, after the war, things settled down a little bit. Here's a picture of my mother in the center, my father on the left, and my father's cousin and their girlfriends or family members. And they're walking in Haifa, Mother Day Haifa. Things got better. Uh, my, I, I don't have that much time, so I'm going to have to slowly wind it down. My family survived. Uh, my parents are no longer alive. My mother-in-law are no longer alive, but here's a picture of our big simcha together. It was my son's bar mitzvah. And here's my father on the right, my mother and my mother-in-law on the left. So this was one of the most joyous occasion for my father. I told you guys, I've only seen him cry once or twice in his life. And when he was asked to come and light a candle for Jacob, it brought him, it brought both my mother and my father to, to tears that they would see the day. I lost, I've been able to track down my, my grandparents, my uncles, my cousins, and I have a list of roughly 50 ancestors of mine that perished during World War II. Uh, these are 50 members of my family that perished. And I mean like aunts, uncles, grandparents, first cousins, some second cousins. And uh, I've, I've, I read this every year during uh, services on Yom HaShoah. Uh, I, I realize I don't know the exact date or time of when they died. I can't say proper Kaddish for them. So during uh, services at Yom HaShoah Holocaust, I will read all these names. So I hope you're all patient with me. Um, one other thing I want to share with you. Uh, back in 2016, I had a call from my rabbi, and he says that our local uh, representative at at, 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 the, at the state was looking for survivors, survivor families, and army veterans, because there is something called uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day in the state of California. And I was asked if I would speak or represent my, my, my parents and, and my mother-in-law, and I agreed to do it. And I went there. It was actually in the assembly, and you could see me there. I was invited to come and attend to be in attendance while they read the proclamation. This is at the state capitol, and I was asked to sit next to my representative, uh, Ling Ling Yang, that's her on the right, and they sit two, two people, <laughs> they're like it's like a classroom, everybody. There's two seats and they share a seat, two representatives, and I was, uh, rep she, I was with Ling Ling, she was from actually the temple, she represents the temple district. And uh, that's it. Got I, I went over time, so I'm going to stop sharing and, and we can ask questions, okay? All right, here I am. So uh, open up the mics. Uh, there's a lot more to talk about, but you know, I, I am limited to 45 minutes. I don't want to take too much time. Um, and uh, thank you for listening. So if there's any, uh, any questions? Thank you very much, David, for sharing this with us. Very uh, heart heartening. And I think a lot of people got uh, information out of it. So thank you. You're welcome. Anybody have any questions for David? Oh, I got yeah, I have one question, David. Hey, yes, David. Sergio. David? Yes. Yeah. My, my question is, are you aware of any of the victims who were not actually reported, who went unreported, and so we don't know who they were? Yes. As a matter of fact, that list of 50 that I showed you, 
until a year ago, they were sort of unknowns. No one has ever, Sergio, no one ever said Kaddish for these people. This is my family members. No one ever read their names. No one know, knows when they died, how they died exactly. We don't really know. The only thing we know is the war started, they got involved in it, and they never came out. So I, to me, it was a very personal yes. responsibility project, you know, a mitzvah for me to dig up these, my family, these are my family members, this is my blood. And I felt that I needed to find out and give these people identities. I can tell you a story, a little story about every one of those people that I've listed for you. They're, they're, they are, uh, a lot of these people are, are uh, parents and great parents and uncles of, of my cousins, you know, which by the way, some are listening to, to I, I invited some of them here and they can tell you similar stories. So some of those people that I have on the list, okay, are my family. And if, and if I didn't document it, Sergio, and I didn't read their name, no, no one else would. Hope it answers your question. I have a question, David. Yes, Nathan. Well, yes. Uh, thank you. Go ahead, Nathan uh, Burnham, by the way, Hi. is my second cousin. I saw on the list um, that my great aunt was there and um, my aunt were, were two of the people on the list that I know the names of, plus you've introduced me to many of the names in the last six to 12 months also. But I'm wondering, how did your parents actually meet? Because all of a sudden you skipped from when your father went to Israel, but I don't know how actually your father and your mother met. My mother and father lived in an area like we live here. They lived in one part of the county of Krakow, Let's say you live in the valley, I live here almost in Orange County. They kind of lived like that in mixed communities and the families knew each other. They, they knew because there's, they both shared an aunt and an uncle who got married. In other words, generation before a young man married a Wasserberger. <laughs> okay, not by blood though, but by, they got, they got married, you know. Uh, so they knew, the families knew each other. Uh, number two, uh, the Jewish community had community centers just the way we have today, and they would get together. The Jews would be together, you know. They would do community events together, and the families knew each other. They, I think there's a story that our great parents uh, were in a band in the 1920s. My parents' parents were involved in a, in a band, you know, like a tango band. I don't know what kind of music they had at the time, and they played... They played musical instruments. My, my grandfather apparently paid the accord, played the accordion, and my mother's, you know, answer state she played the violin. So they they knew each other. When my father came back, I told the story. When my father came back and realized there is no more home, he has to get away from there. He joined a bunch of uh, uh, Palestinian or Israelis. Palestine, they were there. It was Palestine, uh, Jews that that went through Europe and was trying to get to recruit these people to come to, to Palestine, to Israel, the future Israel. And my mother and father, and actually uh, Carrie is here, she's, she's my cousin. So my mother was very close to her sister Felicia. They were very close together and they joined this group, this group that somehow made it on, on uh, they made it with trains, walking, trucks. I don't know how they made it. They made it from Central Europe Apparently there were deportation, uh, 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 there were camps along the way after the war to help people, displaced people, displaced people camp, DP camps. And they would go from one to another until they ended up in Italy. And secretly these ships were hired by rich American organizations. So a lot of your ancestors helped us, which is very good. They, they hired ships to go and to uh, go against British law and bring these refugees, they were, they were refugees, bring these refugees on these boats to Palestine. And my mother and father, they were in their late teens and uh, they were part of that group. They weren't a couple, but they were met. And then they got to Italy and they were there. My mother was with her beloved sister, Felicia. 
And Felicia was a little bit older than my mother. She was in her early 20s. And apparently Felicia had a boyfriend. <laughs> His name was Maurice Rosenfeld. And they became a couple during that time. But my mother was still a bachelorette. And they were all going to go on the ship. And my mother told her sister and future, she told them, you know what, you stay here in Italy. I'll go to Israel. If it's good, I'll write to you. And then you come, you know. <laughs> Uh, needless to say, my mother did go to Israel, was arrested by the British, put in a camp <laughs> again, and she wrote to her sister, Felicia, in Italy, uh, don't come here. <laughs> so my uh, Aunt Felicia ended up with her husband moving to Belgium and eventually immigrated to the United States. And that was my ticket to get the green card. Okay, everybody? <laughs> I'm just joking. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how my America connection was my Aunt Felicia, and she sponsored my family, and that's how we immigrated eventually to the United States. So that's how my parents, oh, they met, they became a couple in a kibbutz. When my parents came to Israel, my mother ended up in a camp. My father says he's never going to another camp in his life. He jumped off the ship into a truck uh, of, of Israeli dock workers. They, they had they had a padded truck. He jumped in. He was the only one on the ship that jumped into this truck. He was taken to the Israeli, um, I forgot the name of the, the Chalutz. I don't remember the name of those groups at the time, Zionist groups. And my mother ended up in Atlit. It was a prison. And later on, they wouldn't even let these refugee boats into Israel. They let them into Cyprus. Whole story. I mean, I can tell you stories about all this. Anyways, when my mother and father came to Israel, they were 19 years old, they were orphans. And the Israeli agencies tried to place these people in foster homes. But how many foster homes can you find, right? Especially for 19 year olds. So there was this kibbutz in the middle of Jordan Valley. Uh, and they were established, this kibbutz was established in the 20s by people who came from the same area where my parents came from. So they spoke German and, and Polish and they knew each other. It was the same culture. And they adopted 20 of those people off the boat. It was called Kibbutz Nevei Tan. And they fostered my mother and father. And when my mother and father were at this kibbutz, that's how they eventually uh, teamed up. And my mother told my father that if he wants her, he has to leave the kibbutz and bring her along. <laughs> um, so th there was the big kibbutz exit, but I won't get into that right now. <laughs> I, I love Israel. Don't, don't, don't give anybody the wrong impression. You're getting an inside view of things. Okay. Uh, David, um, share, share the spelling of your name, how it was pronounced. And then how uh, Karen gets uh, her students to pronounce her name, because I've known you for so long. Well, I come from, from Galatia, which is the border of Prussia. Before World War I, the area of that Poland, it was not Poland. Even though my parents went to Polish school, it was Poland before 1917, before World War I. So their parents, their grandparents, their ancestors grew up in two areas. My mother's family comes from Austria, Hungary. It was called Galatia. It was a state that was annexed by Austria, Hungary in the 1800s. And my father grew up right on the border on the Prussia side. His family comes from the Prussia side. It's kind of like Tijuana and San Diego, if you know what I'm saying. They're, you know, next to each other. Jews who lived in Galatia were given equal rights. That was one of the big thing. But in return, they had to become German cultured. So everybody in that area had to have a German last name. If you saw all the people of my ancestors, uh, we all have German names. It's all Jungmann, which is young man in German, Wasserberger, uh, Bernemann, uh, you know, uh, all these names are German. So they were accepted into the Austrian culture, but they had to adapt. Uh, and they were forbidden from speaking Yiddish. Anyways, what was the question? <laughs> Your name of the spelling? Okay, so uh, my name is Jungmanns, and Jung is spelled with a J, like Carl Jung, the great psychiatrist. Jung means young, man, young man in German, and it's spelled J-U-N-G-M-A-N-N. -N. That's how it's pronounced 
in, uh, in Germany and in Israel, we kept the same. When I came to the United States, uh, they saw Jung, they saw young men, and everybody called us called me young men and young woman and whatever they can think of. So I begged my parents to change the spelling of the name so they don't say junk men, they say young men. Um, I should have put an O there, I didn't. But anyways, I just wanted them to pronounce young men correctly or young, young man, and that's why I changed it to a J. So everybody calls me here young men, except my wife's a teacher and she teaches in a predominantly Hispanic neighborhood today. And guess what? When they say, when they see the spelling of young men, they say, oh, Mrs. Jungman, because in Spanish, Y is pronounced with a J. <laughs> so we, we've come a complete circle on that one, you know. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Uh, thank you for some of my cousins and friends for listening. Hopefully it uh, told a story. And thanks for everybody for listening to what I had to say. Thank you. Sorry, I'm not yeah. displayed, but. I would like to get a copy of the list of the family members that you have. Carrie, what? I, could, I couldn't hear you. A list of family members that you have. Yes. I was noticing a lot of the names, and Nate would probably appreciate this. I saw, you know, Olga Rubenfeld. So I'm sure the sister, the uh, older, family member that had passed away. So I'd like to see the list and see if I recognize anybody's name. You want me to put it up now? No, no, you can just email it to me. Or of course, yes, I found all their records and I, I know who they are. And um, I, I feel pretty confident <laughs> I, found, I found most of our direct blood blood cousins and uncles i think i i do now carrie it's not on your father's side i'm not too familiar with your father's side but it's definitely your mother's side yes by the way i'd like to give some recognition to my cousin being here carrie uh chichini is my cousin she lives in palm Springs. she's um my cousin first cousin and nathan burnham is my second cousin and david the uh, ego here yeah. hi yeah, and I have Ego and Tereska Kohan. They're here too. They're they're my cousins. Let okay, me... we. Uh, I just wanted to share that we we came to the country when when both parents were still alive, and uh, was great pleasure to meet them. And they were so very much uh, showing all the hospitality that they could to us, and they were wonderful people. We heard a lot of a lot of stories from them. So everything <coughs> what David says, it's just. Uh, um, reflects uh, how they how they were and how how be beautiful people they they are, and uh, on the on the side from uh, to getting to the coming back to the story when when the Jews were taken from the Polish cities and and, and going go to to Auschwitz, and, uh, there is a, a thing that they were in the wagons. They were told that they going to to. Ibersiedlung to 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 be placed on different different towns. When they came to Auschwitz, they were all taken to the showers because they said that they gonna be that they gonna be uh, they want them to, to to be clean after the trip. But who whoever went to the showers, it like was dead already because they were instead of showers they met the gas. Uh, in the cabins. So the people who were put aside without the shower, they were the lucky ones who, who survived. Uh, otherwise they were put all to the showers and they were telling they were tell, told that they're gonna that they're gonna be okay after that offer. And they, that's that's what they, they, they that was the, how they died. They did tried. a great presentation. Great thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think my, my